Good evening, everybody. I'd like to start out by thanking Derek Yellen and At The Limits Scientific Committee for this tremendous honor of being able to give the inaugural Lionel Opie Lecture. As a global legend and icon, Lionel was an inspiration and an example to us as South Africans about what is possible and what is achievable with a commitment to academic excellence and scientific rigor. One of the things I remember most about Lionel was his insistence that before accepting any data, information, evidence, that it has to go independent, rigorous, critical analysis. Now with that in mind, the title of my talk is HIV is a risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Is it time for Sub-Saharan Africa to change approach to cardiovascular disease prevention in HIV? What I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes is review the evidence that HIV increases the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, discuss the potential implications of this evidence for Sub-Saharan Africa, where 70% of the people live with HIV, discuss reservations about the applicability of this data and evidence to Sub-Saharan Africa, and then look ahead. I'm going to start by showing you two maps. The first is this rather gloomy or depressing map that actually shows that of the 40 million people worldwide with HIV, two-thirds live in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in fact, 50% live in the eight countries at the tip of the continent. The second map shows the share of people with HIV who were on antiretroviral therapy in 2017. And it actually is much more optimistic and shows one of the great triumphs of healthcare in the last decade in Sub-Saharan Africa, where despite major resource limitations, over 70% of the 25 million people are now on antiretroviral therapy. Now this, of course, is very important because HIV has been transformed by this therapy from a disease that was a near certain death sentence to one where people now live fulfilled, healthier and dignified lives for a much longer time period. So as people with HIV live longer, it's no surprise that the proportion of deaths and disability that are non-AIDS related have grown. What I show you here is a pie chart which looks at the frequency of serious non-AIDS events, non-AIDS related events for people on antiretroviral therapy who are virally suppressed. And what you see is that cancer and cardiovascular disease make up about 70% or 75% of these events. Now, this type of data has led to growing concern amongst HIV clinicians in Sub-Saharan Africa with questions about the public health sector's readiness to deal with this emerging threat to cardiovascular health and calls for a pivot in the approach to cardiovascular disease prevention with adoption of a much more aggressive, proactive CVD preventative approach. Now, if we step back for a second and review and ask the question, what is the evidence that HIV is indeed a risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Let, allow me to share the following with you. So what this figure shows is a summary of the epidemiological studies investigating the relative risk of myocardial infarction and CVD in HIV versus controls. And what you see is that this relative risk hovers around the value two, with some studies showing a little bit greater and some studies showing a little bit uh, less. Proposed mechanisms for this relationship are there studies that suggest that patients with or people living with HIV have higher rates, a higher prevalence of traditional risk factors like smoking and dysglycemia. Uh, that there may be HIV-related risk factors at play, such as systemic uh, active replication, inflammation that persists, subclinical viral replication that persists, and immune dysregulation that also persists. And then there's a school of thought that believes that antiretroviral therapies might be implicated, with certainly evidence that older protease inhibitors were associated with dysglycemia, uh, and other cardiometabolic derangements. Most recently has been the publication of this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis by Shaw and colleagues in Circulation, which looked at five longitudinal studies of people living with HIV with cardiovascular disease outcomes. It had 3.5 million person years of follow-up data to analyze, and it looked at four things. One was the pooled 
global rate of cardiovascular disease in people living with HIV, the pooled risk ratio, HIV-associated cardiovascular disease-related disability-adjusted life years, and finally, the population attributable fraction of HIV-associated uh, cardiovascular disease distributed by geography. And what it showed was that the crude rate for incident cardiovascular disease was 60 per 10,000 patient years, which puts HIV in the same category as other uh, high-risk groups such as diabetes. It showed that the pooled risk ratio was uh, two, which is very similar to those, that uh, figure I showed you earlier, and that the population attributable fraction varied quite greatly by geography with between two and 24%. But most importantly, that in sub-Saharan Africa, this population attributable fraction was 15 to 24 percent. When you looked at the disability-adjusted uh, life years due to HIV, this map shows very clearly in, in red there that sub-Saharan Africa was most affected with 15 to 1,800 dalis per 100,000 persons. Now, this is equal or greater than DALIs due to stroke and tuberculosis, which we all know are major causes of death and disability in Sub-Saharan Africa. The authors conclude, our estimates have important policy implications for implementing appropriate cardiovascular disease risk stratification and treatment strategies across healthcare systems, especially where both HIV and cardiovascular disease are high. Now, some of the proposed new guidelines for evaluation and management of this cardiovascular risk in people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa include that clinics need to be able to assess all these people for the presence of traditional cardiovascular risk factors, that the clinics need to adopt an approach where blood are monitored on a regular interval for lipid levels and dysglycemia, that uh, currently available cardiovascular risk scoring tools integrate HIV as an independent risk factor and I get adopted in these clinics, and that there should be a low threshold for the use of statin therapy and or a low threshold to switch to more cardiometabolically friendly antiretroviral regimens when people with high risk are identified. Now, whether the evidence is robust enough to change the approach and practice uh, to what I just described is not clear. Now, you have to remember that this is in the context of healthcare infrastructure that is already very stretched, where there's competing health needs, there's competing social needs, and many argue that we need to see much more robust evidence before more resources are committed or diverted from where they're already being used. Now, some of the doubts about the data and the evidence is driven by two major themes. One are questions about the accuracy of the modeled estimates of risk and burden as they apply to Sub-Saharan Africa, and two, because of a lack of clarity about the drivers of this excess risk in cardio of cardiovascular disease in people with HIV, and how it can be measured, and thirdly, how it should be managed. Now, if we look at the models that are used to derive healthcare burden estimates for Sub-Saharan Africa, we find that they are frequently inaccurate. Now, it's well known that robust, verifiable population data are sparse in Sub-Saharan Africa. So what's happened over time is global health bodies use sophisticated models to derive these burden, risk, and prevalence estimates. However, where and when these estimates have been compared to local data, the accuracy of the estimates has frequently been found to be questionable. If we take this analysis of mortality trends in South Africa using the South African National Death Register between 97 and 2012 as an example, there were significant discrepancies in the results of the locally derived data with, uh, with the global burden of disease estimates. And the authors had to conclude that more careful calibration of global mo models with local data was necessary between, before any of these data were integrated into policy and practice changes. If we go back to that systematic review and meta-analysis, we find that only one of the five longitudinal studies was from South Sub-Saharan Africa, and that there were only 25 events, none of them myocardial infarctions, in the cohorts of people living with HIV. 
and that the rest of the data was actually, again, models uh, derived from estimates from the global burden of disease and other estimates that have been questioned and challenged over time. If we look at the prevalence and distribution of cardiovascular risk factors, we find that it varies significantly by geography in both people living with HIV and general population, again warning us not to extrapolate data from one region to another. So if we, the, this slide shows four maps from the World Health Organization looking at the age structure, the prevalence of dysglycemia, dyslipidemia, and, uh, and smoking across the globe. And what you find is that for each of these risk factors, when you look in sub-Saharan Africa, the risk is, and the, or the prevalence is much lower for each of these risk factors than it is elsewhere in the world. If we look at prospective cohorts, they suggest that HIV-associated ischemic heart disease is much lower in sub-Saharan Africa than the modeled estimates would have predicted. A prime example of this is the Heart of Soweto cohort study published in the European Heart Journal in 2012. It evaluated <coughs> prospectively over 500 incident cardiovascular events and was designed to determine the spectrum of cardiac disease and people living with HIV being admitted with these cardiac events to a large hospital in Johannesburg, South Africa. And what they found was only 2.7% of these events were atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease related. Um, whereas models would have predicted that between 20 and 30 of percent of these events would have been atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. To date, there have been about nine studies trying to look at more proximal or surrogate markers of atherosclerosis and cardio carotid intermedia thickness is a prime example. And again, if you look at the data from these nine studies, looking at HIV and the degree to which it correlates with carotid intima thickness, you find that the results are actually inconsistent and very difficult to interpret. This is not true in the same region when you look at traditional risk factors and their relationship with cardio carotid intima media thickness. <clears throat> and then if you look at the primary drivers of excess risk and events, they are likely to be HIV-related as opposed to cardiometabolic, with implications, again, for prevention strategies and treatment strategies. So the evidence for this comes from ob an observational analysis of prospective cohort data for 90,000 adults with HIV collected from Public Health England. Now, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier event-free survival estimates that are stratified by CD4 counts, you find that the events are very much related to the CD4 count, with those starting antiretrovirals at the lowest CD4 counts, having the most number of events over time and death over time. Of the non-AIDS events, cardiovascular disease and stroke constituted 18%. And what was very important is that the standardized risk ratio for cardiovascular disease in those with HIV was highest in their first year of antiretroviral therapy. Now, importantly, this tapered quite sharply over time, such that the risk ratio returned to general population risk by year three. The implication of this, of course, is that the excess risk is related very much to advanced HIV and related factors and to delays to initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Furthermore, if we look at emerging evidence, it suggests that a significant proportion of myocardial infarctions in people living with HIV may not be similar to that experience in the general population. Now, for those of you who are not cardiologists, I'd like to take you back and remind you that there are multiple types of myocardial infarction. The one experienced by the majority of the population is so-called type 1, and it is driven by plaque rupture, plaque fissuring, and atherothrombosis, so atherothrombotic occlusion of blood vessels with subsequent myocardial necrosis and infarction. Type 2 infarctions are much more related to supply demand and are frequently triggered by things like sepsis, hypoxia, and uh, renal failure. And again, over 80% of MIs in the general population tend to be type 1. So more recently, uh, whether or not patients with HIV get type 1 or type 2 
infarctions have been looked at by analysis of over 30,000 patients with 600 myocardial infarction events in the Center for AIDS Research Network in the United States. And what they found was over 50% of recorded myocardial infarctions were indeed type 2, i.e. related to supply demand triggered by events like sepsis and hypoxia. Again, the implication of this is important because such events are not necessarily prevented by interventions such as statins. Finally, if you look at risk stratification tools that are applicable in the general population, at least in North America and Europe, you find that when you try to apply these, these risk tools to Sub-Saharan Africa and patients living with HIV specifically, that there are major challenges. So there have been, uh, again, mounting data that looks at Framingham risk score, the ACC atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk score, and similar risk scores that show that when applied to people living with HIV, they either grossly overestimate or grossly underestimate the risk. And so it therefore makes sense that until validated scores are developed for people living with HIV, and specifically people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa, it may be difficult to uh, justify their wholesale adoption uh, for use in our clinics. So what is the way forward? I think it's fair to say uh, that we need increasing awareness of the fact that people with living living with HIV do have non-AIDS-related events, and that cardiovascular disease is an important part of this, that we need better integration of HIV and NCD services so that those with a combination of hypertension and other cardiometabolic diseases can be managed in a single sitting, uh, that we can advocate for improved screening and management of these cardiometabolic risk factors as per local capacity, that we need to promote healthy lifestyle and focus on smoking, obesity, healthy diet, and other exercise, uh, and exercise, for example. But it's also fair to say that it might be that the mainstay of cardiovascular prevention and management of this excess risk that we encounter in HIV may actually be earlier and better management of their HIV. And that until we have more robust data and evidence, it might be that we hold off on adopting these ACC and ESC style guidelines um, and that they might not be appropriate at this time yet, given what it might mean for the healthcare systems. With regard to research, I'd like to say, uh, again, there's promising, uh, information available that there are a number of prospective cohorts throughout the continent. I've given examples of the HIV and Zovu cohort study that will be looking at um, cardiovascular disease, both in terms of burden, burden and risk and management in sub-Saharan Africa. And then there's a more global study looking at populations throughout the globe and the impact of interventions like st statins as preventative treatment. So to summarize and conclude, what I've been able, what I've tried to persuade you is that HIV is indeed uh, associated with a relative risk of about two for myocardial infarction and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease based on the available evidence, that models of the burden of HIV associated cardiovascular disease in sub-Saharan Africa suggests actually that a public health crisis is, is imminent, that the implications of the on the public health care approach are not clear at present, and that what we actually need is more research, better models, and improved understanding of how HIV interacts with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease uh, before we overhaul the current very successful HIV prevention and management system and divert available resources, which might not necess be necessary. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and patience and for listening to my talk. <music>